So, the altar stone at Stonehenge came from Scotland, which rather begs the questions how and why. Honest truth, haven't a clue. Let's talk about that. So, Rupert, uh, what was your reaction when this first came up in the news? Not so long ago. Uh, not so long ago. No, I, honestly, my first reaction was... Uh, I, uh, this sounds weird, but in, in a way it was relief, you know, because, <laughs> well, <laughs> would, you know, when we had, a couple of years ago, we had all this stuff about, um, from Mike Parker Pearson's work and the, the, the notion that, that Wine Morn, the circle at Wine Morn had been... Uh, relocated to Stonehenge, and then that turned out to be not the case. And and the fact that they've been looking for locations for the altar stone, basically following from the Priscillas and going eastwards, trying to find yeah. the place. And and it was looking more and more as if you know maybe these were stones at Stonehenge that had come from different places. And then suddenly, finally, you get this. No, it came from Scotland. And to me, it just seemed to makes so much more sense actually if you've got half of the site from wales that uh, right. to have this coming together of or, or stones brought from different okay. places around the landmass that's what it was for me i i loved it made my day oh. so ever for you everything fell into place indeed fascinating <laughs> okay anyway let's um let's uh, bring a bit more context to it and talk about what the altar stone is mm. you know where it is, what its relationship in Stonehenge is, and, and a bit of, you know, background to what people have thought previous to this. Mm. It's quite a bombshell in many ways, isn't it? You know, just having it <sighs> nailed down. We'll talk it, about the science it, a little bit, but you know, it's it, this is very secure. It, it really is. I mean, for anybody who doesn't know, the the altar stone. Um, we should talk about the name at some point as well, but um, but the altar yeah. stone. So basically, it is. The central stone, really, it's where um, that is. It's still partially buried, um, but uh, but the fact that it is a stone very very central to the site and is another mm. one that was always thought to have come from Wales. You know, it's very much of bluestone uh, essence. And uh, well, it was called. It was included in the blue stone mm. sort of collection, but it is of a different stone type. That's the important thing. Uh, that the, uh, the the blue stones were tended to be named for the fact that they were from elsewhere, rather mm. than, than that. You know, you know, majority of them sort of have a sort of blue tinge to them. But, but blue it stones had, it be been became a general term. Yes, but it had yeah. been grouped in that lot, hadn't it? And yeah. um, so not local, basically. Not um, local. And uh, it's uh, the, the fact that it's so central to the site and the fact that it has been shown to come from Scotland, uh, that raises so many uh, questions uh, about, yeah. you know, its importance in the site and the fact that it came from so far away. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. Are we going to so look at the it is, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's five metres long, one metre across and half a metre deep, as far as I can tell. And it lies six flat. tonnes in weight, yes. Six tonnes in weight. It lies uh, absolutely perpendicular, right bang centre on the sunrise-sunset uh, line, northeast, you know, south southwest. Um, and really now all you can see is it's uh, one of its upper surfaces. Uh, and it's hidden, um, apart from the fact that it's in a, you know, partially uh, subterranean, uh, is that it's hidden in under stones uh, 55B and 156. Is that <laughs> well <done. laughs> Yes. 55B uh, is part of the, one, the fallen uh, big, huge sarsens, so the largest, the tallest triliton stones. Um, only one of those is still standing. Uh, Fifty-five um, mm. fell and split uh, in half, uh, taking the lintel one five six with it, which is also uh, partially covering uh, stone number eighty in the uh, <laughs> in the numbering of Stonehenge stones. Are you taking are. notes, so, folks? 
<laughs> yeah, yes. Hopefully I'll be showing you diagrams and maps and all those kinds of things, yes. So it also stands out in the fact that um, um, it is completely alien. In It's the only sandstone stone uh, amongst all the Stonehenge stones, as we know, the, you know, the big uh, uh, trilithons made of relatively local um, uh, sarsen stone, uh, the blue stones come from the Priscellis, which are uh, rhyolite and dolerite. Uh, but the sandstone, wow, that's uh, something uh, different entirely. Mm. Uh, and, you know, people have been trying to sort out where that came from for since, well, since, since forever. I mean, the, uh, the blue stones, uh, there have been all sorts of theories, you know, since the 17th century. Uh, uh, 19th century onward about where all the blue stones uh, came from. Um, have you got anything more to? Have you got anything to say about that, Rupert? Do you know? I, I not really. I just think that the it, it, over the years, you know, the 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 ideas of uh, of where the stones came from, and most particularly the altar stone, because once they had established that uh, that the blue stones came from Pacelli and the altar stone was the one thing that they couldn't figure out uh, yeah. because we know that the Sarsons came from Westwoods and around the Mulberry Downs. Yeah. Um, so it's the altar stone has has always been the the fly in the ointment, hasn't it really? And uh, and hats off to uh, 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 Richard Bevins and uh, and Robert Ixo who've been I mean how long have they been working on this? A oh, very forever. very long time. Yeah. 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 Um, I actually don't know what set off this current thing that led to because the, the I mean it's quite funny really that uh, that the chap who actually isolated this and if he, he was part of a team but the chap that made this uh, discovery is uh, a, a Welsh PhD student uh, called Anthony Clark. Um, yep. who lives in Australia. <laughs> and so from Wales to Australia, and um, it's quite funny that he should be the one to uh, to tell his his countrymen that, uh, no, the Alderstone didn't come from Wales. Mm. Um, yeah, he feels quite guilty about that. <laughs> if I'm getting this right, I mean, the, the sequence of events is this. In, uh, prior to Herbert Thomas firstly saying, the blue stones came from uh, the Priscellis. Yeah, um, it, it was uh, early twentieth century, that wasn't it? Nineteen uh, thirties, wasn't it? But thirties, yeah, something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the, the theories about it coming from Dartmoor, Leicestershire, mm -hmm. Ireland, you know, um, as, or as far away as Africa, <laughs> was surmised once upon a time. But anyway, mm -hmm. no, I mean, Herbert Thomas, you know, said because he knew the Priscellis. Uh, and he sort of, uh, you know, uh, identified the blue stones as having come from or put forward the hypothesis. And this was, of course, absolutely confirmed by uh, Ixa and, and Bevins not so uh, long ago. So mm. much so that they've been able to nail down the very quarries um, mm. from which the the the, uh, the the dolerite and rhyolite blue stones came from. Now, those having come from um, Pembrokeshire, um, now there are sandstone uh, outcrops. If you're looking for where the altar stone came from, there are sandstone outcrops all over Britain. And, of course, there are some down in South Wales stretching up into the Brecon Beacons from uh, the Pembrokeshire area and uh, up you know, almost as far as the Welsh-English uh, border. So because... Um, they were already looking in the Pembrokeshire area. It seemed logical to include those sandstone areas as possible sources for the uh, altar stones, seeing as they were from the vicinity or either that or on the route that uh, the blue stones may or may not have taken. So people say that it was previously thought that the, uh, the altar stone came from the Seni. Uh, range uh, or deposits of, of sandstone. But they were only really under consideration. It was sort of the firmest area because only because of coin, um, of uh, the association with the root of the um, uh, Priscelli blue stones. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a working hypothesis, put it that way. 
But Bevins and Ixa were never able to match the sandstone of the altar stone to that, those ranges of, um, uh, uh, of sandstone down in South Wales. So behind the scenes, the search was always on for another source. Um, and uh, I think uh, I think Bevins and if I'm reading this right, I think Bevins and Ixa came up with that. And the reason that Anthony Clark uh, in Australia happens to be in this is because he had access to uh, particular machines and uh, petrographic uh, analysis machines that are used in the copper industry in Australia. Ah, that makes Don't sense. Don't quote me on that. I think that's kind of what happened, which is why mm. you get this analysis being done in Australia, not somewhere uh, mm. in England. I don't know if you wanted to go into the geochemistry, but uh, I, I think uh, it's fair to say if you get I might the... want to, but our viewers probably don't. <laughs> well, no, that's the thing. If you if you get to the the, the source paper. Yeah. It is almost impenetrable. Uh, in, unless you know a bit about geochemistry, I don't. Um, but it's just, it's you, you know that you're reading English, but... <laughs> <laughs> not, as no, not as we know it, Jim. <laughs> no, uh, but actually, I mean, joking aside, the, the research and the depth oh. of analysis is absolutely staggering. Um, yeah. And when you see, um, uh, they've given you... Uh, graphs, if you like, for uh, the uh, the readings for each uh, mineral uh, chemical yeah. signature. I mean, and, the great uh, thing you... about it is that it's open access. Um, yes. They've decided to make it op open access, yeah. so it's free yeah. to view for anybody. Yeah. And uh, I'll put a link uh, uh, down in the description below yeah. to that. Uh, and the, the, the way the uh, the graphs overlap with, uh, uh, with the Orcadian Basin is, uh, well, argue with that. I think not. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if, it seems we've established that uh, the altar stone definitely came from Scotland. Moreover, mm -hmm. uh, not just Scotland, but the North East um, um, in, in the, uh, from not far from Caithness or even as far mm -hmm. as Orkney, it seems, mm -hmm. uh, where the two samples they've worked with com for comparison uh, have come from. Mm -hmm. So, oh, before we go any further, just in case anybody was thinking this, where did they get the bits of um, altar stone to do the analysis from? Nobody, but nobody gets to chip any stone off any bit of Stonehenge <laughs> stone in modern days. This is from a chip that was taken off, I think, in the 1840s or something like that, sometime yeah. in the 19th century, as, and has since been sliced uh, quite considerably <laughs> to yes. obtain samples. Uh, so, yeah. No, no, no stone. No stones were harmed in the making of this study. <laughs> yes, well, not harmed any more than they had been previously. No. So anyway, it, it's kind of established. Let us move on to you know what that throws up, what that um, means for our rethinking or confirmation of the way we were already thinking or what have you uh, about uh, the people that built Stonehenge? Yes. Well, I suppose the uh, one of the biggest questions that people are always going to have is how did it get there? Um, uh, because uh, some people argue in the same way they have, uh, you know, when it was thought that stones came from uh, from Wales, you know, did they drag them across uh, across the land or did they take them around the coast uh, on rafts or what have you, uh, and the same question can uh, can apply here. Which, if they if it was taken by water, which route did they take? Um, I think it's just as likely that they dragged it across land. Frankly, um, you know, we did mm -hmm. that uh, piece uh, not that long ago, um, where we were looking at uh, cattle being used in uh, dragging of things because they'd found. In various places now, they've found evidence for cattle being used for traction. And and the thing is that a cow can pull its own weight very easily. So if you've got a, an average, say, a ton weight of cow, you only need half a dozen of them and they can drag that at a, an easy walk. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's not a big ask really other than the fact that it would have taken quite a long time to take uh, any amount of cows 450 miles i think it's isn't it 450 miles 700 and something kilometers anyway yes. um, that's that's my preferred theory personally 
Mm. Uh, I don't know what you think and on that. If now knowing um, uh, Ixer and Bevins, I bet uh, it won't be too long before they've narrowed down um, where the stone came from to mm. uh, with a great deal more precision. Mm. And if it did come from Orkney, then that would have involved a sea journey anyway. You can't yes. get away from that. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I have to say, if I was, uh, if they did show that it came from Orkney, as opposed to the mainland, just up in that direction, then uh, th- that would probably be a good case for reassessing that. If you've got to take it yeah. on water anyway, then you're probably better off yeah. coming round, coming around the coast, I would think. But I tell you what, that stretch between the mainland and Orkney wouldn't be my favourite bit of water <laughs> to transport a six-ton no. bit of stone in. No. A- Whatever boat, like I mean, it's um, it's spectacular enough sometimes on a ferry. Yeah, you know, a modern ferry. Uh, those people clearly really did know what they were doing when it came to moving across those waters. There's no question of that. Yeah. Mm, mm. Um, but I don't think uh, either of us are going to speculate. Really, come down one side or the other as to no. um, <clears throat> whether it was a, a sea route mm. or a, or a land route. Mike mm. Pitts um, favours a land route. Mm. Um, those interested um, it actually is an interesting uh, read um, this is obviously printed well this is printed in uh, 2022 mm-hmm. though he does have a hint in in here he had a notion that uh, Bevins and Ixa were going to look at Scotland there's a little there's a sentence in there which uh, g- gives that away mm. um, but uh, Mike Pitts is all for the idea that uh, a land route would involve the maximum number of people so that the the transportation of the stones, and he says it's about the blue stones as well, that the transportation of the stones was, you know, was an overt thing to to involve the maximum number of people possible, which Mm. you don't do if you've taken something... uh, something by sea. So there's That's something in that. Very, very true. And also we do know that uh, another piece that we did um, a couple of years back about the uh, the Grus, the granite from uh, from oh, Northumbria yes. that was found in West Kennet, which is, uh, well, close to Avery, 20 miles-ish north of, of Stonehenge, where clearly people were bringing pieces of stone from where they lived yeah. to this new place, whatever that might mean. You know, you can write any story you like uh, along those lines, but they they were finding pieces that were clearly transported a long way. And some of them were quite big stones. You know, people were carrying... There was effort involved in carrying these things. There was effort, Mm. but then here's the thing that bends my brain a bit. Those stones uh, at West Kennet are not the sort of stones you'd travel up to Northumbria to go and get... (laughs) No, that's very true. They are very mm. nondescript, mm. and they're not, you know, standing stones. They're not put in the landscape. They're not. They're just deposited in the bottom of pits and yeah. uh, in post one holes instance, and the like. Yeah, you know, r- round uh, round a, a, a grave in mm. one instance, and mm. they're, they're they're sort of cobblestone size. They're they're really not grand it, at they're, all. They're, you couldn't make tools from them. No. So, no. to my mind, that speaks to something about people taking a bit of their identity mm. with them having yeah. moved to somewhere else yeah yeah and i i think that's a po- very powerful thing it's, it's it's making me think that um uh, people in the neolithic at the v- very least were very identified with their geology mm. yeah. yeah we are the people of the such and such stone we're the people of this stone where and this is particular yeah. to britain because britain has such a freaking anomalous uh, uh, geology. It is so mixed up, which is what gives us our wonderful landscapes and, and varied mm. landscapes, you know, uh, within you know, such a small small area. It's because we've got crazy geology here. Yeah, it was true. a collision of many, many a uh, sort of Paleozoic, mm. um, con- you know, continent. <laughs> <laughs> it, it seems brought all these uh, types of st- stone together and, and yeah. give people different I- strong identities to different areas. So, which do you favour, Rupert? Do you favour the idea of people going to Scotland 
from Stonehenge and bringing stuff back and going to Preseli, the Preseli Mountains and, and bringing stuff back? Or what about the people come, coming all the way from Scotland, bringing a bit of themselves with it? I favour that. You do? I really do. Um, and do you know something else that I find really evocative, this sounds like I'm going off on one and I'm really not, is uh, I was looking at the Stone of Scone the stone of scone upon which we still crown our monarchs. Now, the stone of scone, nobody knows its uh, its true uh, origin other than uh, it comes from scone in uh, near Perthshire in Scotland. And it was stolen by the British, and then it was 1996 that it was given back to Scotland. But it's still brought down to uh, to London for the coronation of a monarch. Now... The thing is, if the monarchs have been crowned on that stone for we don't know how long, it goes, you know, we don't know. It could go back so deep into the past. And so to have a stone from Scotland that's carried down uh, to uh, England, and now we've got a different stone that we know about that was taken, and it's a central piece to Stonehenge, one of the most important sites in Britain. Uh, to me, there's something... Um, really quite gripping about that you know is that coincidence yeah. uh whichever way it is there's an enormous statement being made mm. about something and you know, we, we can probably never know it, what that is mm. um but it must have had huge huge meaning for the people that uh, that knew about it i think they should do petrology on the stone of scone <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah. <laughs> uh, the other element of things travelling, of course, is the fact that from Orkney um, is uh, grooved ware pottery, which seems to have or originated and travelled and the style been adopted over a couple of centuries down to Durrington Walls and Stonehenge a area. And makes, that makes you think, oh, well, was there a gradual travelling of people? I don't think so. I think that the the grooved ware thing was a, a, a cultural thing, mm. uh, but I, I, it's easy to conflate the two. You know, something travelling all that way down there with the pottery travelling, and I don't think the two match. But they do make the connection. There must, you know, the, yeah. the, it enhances a connection, but not the travelling of stuff. If you sort I, of get the I distinction, I don't think we should ever. Uh, forget the uh, the sophistication or, um, and uh, and scale of the trade routes either. Mm. You know, we know that um, that at that period stuff was coming from Europe into Britain and uh, Scandinavia into Britain. It's uh, you know, so the fact that people were moving around. You know, you're talking about pottery that yeah. uh, that you know from a trading point of view. Yeah, it could have travelled so rapidly, really. Mm -hmm. um, before we uh, wrap up, would you just say a few words about the possibilities of glaciation? Um, <laughs> uh, um, because you know it, it's one of those uh, old things that uh, that comes up, and there have been a few reactions I've noted uh, online you know, that still say, "Well, it could could have been." Mm. Um, but looking at it, no, I don't think it could actually have been if the uh, glacial data that we know of is to be taken at, um, at, at face va value. That yes. said, I, yeah. I did become aware that there are a couple of huge um, glacial erratics on the North Devon coast that came all the way from West Scotland. Mm. But the glaciation on that side of the country seems to have been a completely different character. You've got a great flow down the... Uh, middle of the Irish Sea or what was called the the, the Celtic Sea mm. which could account for that in the very earliest of the, the glaciations I think it's called the Anglian Advance but over the east side which we've got to take into account and particularly from the area uh, of the uh, Ordovician um, stone up there that at the time of certainly of the last uh, big uh, glaciation the la last maximum the the flow would have been north, yeah, in that area, taking taking any stone from that area towards the north, not down from the south. Mm. And if you go back to the earlier glaciations, even then, on that side of the country, stone would have been sort of transported out into what's the now the North Sea, mm. 
rather than directly south, which you you do need to account for. Uh, uh, you know, if, if the data that we have, and there's no reason that we should question that uh, uh, that geological uh, data, that from that point of view, that even if mm. the altar stone was a glacial erratic or is a glacial erratic, it would still have had to have been carried an enormous distance. You know, even if it was from the west, it would have had to have been carried an enormous distance to bring it to Stonehenge. So it doesn't solve the problem. Uh, you know, it's uh, the people who do uh, like to think of uh, uh, of it being glacial erratics. Then, uh, you know, it, it's raised more questions for them to answer, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, at the very least, you'd still have 50 miles to account for. Yes, yes, on a, the, on a good day. Yeah, because uh, at, at the very least, because the ice didn't reach that far. Hmm. Hey-ho! Uh, do you know, there's, there's another question, really, that uh, that I think comes up there, is that uh, if it's f if it was from Scotland, and we know how important Nessa Brodger and all that, we know how important Scotland was... If it was an erratic that had been carried by glacier from Scotland to, say, Devon, then why would they choose that stone? What freakish coincidence would it be that they took yeah. a Scottish stone from Devon to bring it mm. to the Stonehenge? I just think it's uh, it yeah. just it's too big an ask. This is the, the big problem with the glaciation thing, is that glaciers themselves are not selective. They take everything. <laughs> yeah? Mm. Absolutely um, everything, yes. And yeah. they jumble it all up and spread it all over the place. Mm. So why, you know, if that was the case, would humans select that? So anyway, that's it. I'm pretty much uh, spent as far as, uh, I, I think, expanding <laughs> upon the hows and whys and wheres of, yes. uh, of this. I'm sure that... Plenty more to be uh, to be said. Oh, by the way, folks, I forgot to mention at the very top of the program. If you enjoy this this stuff, please do hit the like and subscribe button. Uh, you know it helps us so much. And if you want to help us even more, do consider uh, join becoming a Patreon member. Link in the description below. And also, there's a buy me a coffee campaign supporting the Gobekli Tepe to Stonehenge project. Uh, again, links to find out more about that down below. Uh, and with that, I think it is time for us to uh, sign off yes. for now. Yes, there, thank Actually, there are so many more talking points a a about this. But, um, yeah, I'd be interested to see what comes up in the comments below. Indeed. Got ideas about uh, whys and whats and wheres and hows. <laughs> All right. Thanks for watching, folks. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Cheers for now. Bye. Bye-bye. Ah, uh, very good. Uh, who who knew that uh, we <laughs> knew so much? My oh, poor old brain can't take this. I don't. Uh, stop. Um, uh, stop. Frank, I suppose I'd better stop me as well.